a, I guess, a varied background. I have a master's degree in psychology, worked in business and consulting for, uh, for several years. I have taught psychology at a community college for nearly 20 years. Uh, also sometimes teach the intro study skill, welcome to college type courses there as well. Um, I'm a homeschool mom. I, my son is actually class of 2020, so he is graduating this year. So I have mixed the feelings about that. Um, I, like I said, I'm with Home Life Academy. I am a counselor there and a team leader for the counselors. I've also been involved with uh, local co-ops and, and teaching for homeschoolers as well. So I want to start out by kind of um, kind of saying why this topic? Why um, are we looking at study skills and the psychology of memory? Um, and really it has to do with this is a topic that I have taught in various arenas to students over the years um, at the community college, in classes for our co-op, and inevitably I have students who come up to me afterwards and are like, this changed my life. Why didn't anybody tell me this before? If I really understood how the brain works relative to memory, I, I would have studied differently all these years. Um, on occasion, I've come home to a, a message on my uh, uh, voicemail where a student has said, oh, I tried it, it just really worked. You know, I used these techniques and I did great on my exam today in, a, in another course. Um, and, and I think part of it is, our, these are things that we as parents probably tell our students but I don't know if you're like me, sometimes my students answer is why, or question is why. Um, and so this, this presentation, or what we're gonna do today, is actually gonna, gonna look at that. We're gonna look a little bit about the uh, science of memory, and then how to use that information to study smarter, not harder, um, which is, is kind of one of my uh, favorite, I guess, um, ways to describe this. So, I hope y'all bear with me doing this on a Zoom video is a little different. Usually I walk around, um, you know, I'm one of those type of people. If you fall asleep, I'm gonna stand right next to you and talk. Um, so you wake up and there I am. Um, but, uh, in, and I do usually have a lot of participation from the students. So we're gonna kind of do that in a different way today. I am gonna ask you to have a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. So if you don't have one, maybe you can grab those real quick. And if you will, uh, even though we won't all be sharing at the same time, if you wouldn't mind participating in, in uh, this activity that we're gonna start with, um, I think that'll help you get a better understanding um, and a way to describe to your students and your children about um, uh, how to study in a way that makes sense. All right, so got your paper and pencil. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. All right, okay. So what we're gonna start out with, I think sometimes the best way to learn is by actually experiencing things. Um, so we're gonna do that together today and we're gonna start out by testing our memory or your memory. Um, so don't be too freaked out by that, just relax. And um, if you will now put down your pencil and pen, don't be, don't be using those here for a few minutes. Um, I am going to read to you a list of 21 words, okay? And after I read that list, I'm going to wait a few seconds, um, and then I'm going to tell you when it's time for you to write down as many of those words as you can remember, all right? And then we're going to kind of look, take a look at the types of um, things that help our memory and the types of things that might hinder our memory. Okay, you ready? All right. Bed, quilt, dark, silence, fatigue, clock, snoring, night, toss, Tired, night, 
toss, turn, night, yawn, artichoke, turn, night, okay, more words, blanket, rest, three. Just wait silently for a couple seconds here. All right, so go ahead and write down all that you remember from that list I just read. All right, write down your last words. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a typical um, response pattern that we get um, in this type of situation. So I have done this exact exercise um, hundreds of times over the last 20 years. And actually, um, I keep waiting for the day that it fails, but it, it, I always get the same basic results. And I'm going to show you those right now, and you can see where you kind of fall along this continuum. So here is uh, the graph, and you can kind of see the higher, you know, the bar is, that's the more people who answered that correctly. All right, so you can kind of get an idea of that. And again, this is the exact same pattern that I've got over and over and over again. When I've had classes with over 40 people down to classes with 10, this pattern is what I've seen over and over again when we have done this activity. So let's now talk about what this shows us. All right, so the first thing that we're going to look at here, grab myself a pen color here, is this section sleep or this word sleep right here. All right. Um, how many folks got the word sleep on their list somewhere? It doesn't have to be in order at all. All right, so what I consistently find every time I do this is that one third to one half of the group that I work with remembers the word sleep. So if, you're, if you remembered the word sleep, you're in that group of one third to one half of participants who remember the word sleep, even though it was not on the list that I read, okay? So I never said the word sleep. So then the question set is, why do people remember a word that I never said? And I think if we take a look at this or think about it, we all realize, you know, sleep made sense with, you know, with most of the other words that I said. Um, and that's a lot of times why we remember it. This is something that we call constructive memory or the constructive nature of memory. And that what that means is that, um, our memories are not like videotapes and 100% accurate. Our memories um, can be inaccurate. They can be changed after the fact even. And um, this is something that sometimes impacts students when they're studying material. Usually this is when a student maybe is uh, taking a test or talking with somebody and um, they give a wrong answer, but you can kind of see why they thought that, you know, it's like, oh yeah, it's, you know, sleep makes sense, but that is not what was given. That is not what we were talking about here. So it makes sense, it's related, etc. But it just because we believe that we heard the word sleep does not mean that we did. So one of the, the funny things that happens lots of times is we see that um, 
no matter how confident a person is in something that they're saying, their confidence does not relate to the accuracy of the information. So just because they 100% believe that they heard the word sleep does not mean that I read the word sleep. I had students who've had to come out, come up front and look at my paper to see that sleep was not on the list because they were absolutely certain that they heard me say that. So how do we avoid this then when we're trying to maximize our memory, you know, especially as we're helping our students learn, not just for the moment or not just to be exposed to something, but to really know it, to really understand it and to have the details down. Um, one thing, and I know this is just kind of an overriding word, but one thing to do is to overstudy. Lots of times students will think, and you've probably seen this with your kids, um, uh, I don't know, they get tired, they get bored, and they're like, yeah, yeah, I get it, yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. Um, and so what they're saying is they can look at it and recognize it, and yeah, it makes sense, but that doesn't mean that they really know the information at a deeper level. So sometimes we have to get our students to understand that what they think is understanding the material, which may be just looking at it or being able to read through it and kind of understand what's going on, is differently, is different from really understanding the material. And that's going to take some more work. Um, they have to actively learn the material to avoid this type of constructive memory error where they just, you know, it looks right and they select it. It's, it's what a lot of folks um, uh, on tests, that's a lot of ways that you separate the AB stu students from the CD students is by these types of questions. Um, in order to avoid that, a student has to be actively learning. Lots of times, um, and you know, I think homeschoolers aren't as bad at this as, as some other um, type of students traditionally, where you know the students like, okay, yeah, teach me, you know, type of thing. They just kind of um, are waiting for you to give them the material, and they're very passive in their learning environment. The more that you can encourage your student to be actively engaged in what they're learning, to think about what they're learning, to ask questions in their mind and wonder why in their mind that this is the case, the more that they're going to remember the information correctly. Okay, so it's not a passive thing at all. Uh, I've, I know I talk to students sometimes who will say, you know, well, I had the book open for two hours, you know, and I was actually reading for two hours. And then at the end, I realized I knew nothing, you know, um, but yet they can check off that box. I studied this for two hours. And um, that's not really the important thing. The important thing is understanding and learning the material. Um, if you're learning something new, whether with a lecture or a book that you're reading, um, actively learning and engaging your mind means not just copying down what's in the book exactly, not just copying down what the teacher or your parent is saying exactly, but instead engaging your mind, working with that material and writing it down in your own words. If you write it down in your own words, you understand the material. If you are just copying word for word what is in a book that you're studying or word for word what your teacher, or your mom is saying to you, you don't really internalize uh, that information as much. And that's hard for students sometimes. Um, you know, it's a skill that we try to teach them with writing as well is, you know, um, to, to put things in your own words and, and to kind of, you know, integrate different topics. They need to be doing that when they're uh, learning material as well. So don't just copy it down. Don't just transcribe notes. I think that's one of the things with, um, uh, computers. You know, people can type sometimes so fast that when they're taking notes on a computer, they end up actually transcribing or writing word for word what the person is saying, but they're not really engaging their mind and understanding the material. So again, put the information in your own words, summarize it in your own words. Um, if you're working with a student and you're trying to teach them something, um, encourage participation. You know, again, it's not just let's get through this lesson. It's like, let's think about it. Let's talk about it. Let's wonder about it. And the more that you can do that, the more the student is going to remember and really truly understand the material. So I just think this topic of constructive memory is fascinating. If you're interested in it, there's a 
a researcher, Elizabeth Loftus, who has done um, a, a lot of research, and actually she testifies in a lot of court cases as well um, about the fallibility of eyewitness testimony. Um, her expertise is kind of like how inaccurate our memories can be. Um, and sometimes her studies have been kind of funny, like people, if you ask someone about a car accident and you say, how fast was the car going when they hit the pole versus how fast was the car going when it smashed into the pole, choose the words can affect a person's memory of the speed that um, that the car was going. So some of her stuff is kind of fun, you know, to look at. Um, some of the research in this area is really sad, though. Um, examples of where someone was sent to prison on the basis of eyewitness testimony and um, the person 100% believed that that person was guilty. And then, of course, years later with DNA testing, we find out they're not, you know, and the eyewitness um, who, you know, put them as the person who did the crime wasn't trying to give wrong information. Um, they believed what they said at the time. So anyway, it, um, uh, there's a lot of implications uh, in this and it's just kind of interesting to read about also if your student is um, or you are interested in some of that. All right, so let's take a look at our next section here. Oops, let me get done here. I'm having trouble going to the next slide. Just a second. Oh, there we go. All right. So the next thing that I want to point out is these blue areas. Okay. So let me grab a pen here. Y'all know I'm just kind of having fun with this pen thing. I just discovered it. Sorry. <laughs> but anyway, so we've got um, in my classes, nearly everybody remembers these whoops, sorry, these words right here, bed and quilt. So you might see, did you remember those? And just about everybody remembers these words at the very end, okay? The blanket, rest, and dream. Although usually bed and quilt is a little higher than blanket, rest, and dream. So what is going on here, all right? This is something that we call the serial position effect or the primacy recency effect. And um, it's something that we've all probably experienced at different times. Times you have um, uh, a grocery list and you remember the first few things on the list. Maybe you remember the last thing somebody told you to get on your way out the door, but you're more likely to forget the stuff in the middle. All right, so that is kind of what this is. We tend to remember things at the beginning, like with bed and quilt, that's the primacy effect. Um, and, and then we tend to remember things at the end, like the blanket, rest and dream, and we call that the recency effect. All right, um, maybe that, that the ones from the beginning have already made it deep into our long-term memory. It may be that the ones at the end are still in our short-term memory because we just heard those words, maybe right before we closed the book or right before we walked out the door. Um, those were the words somebody said to us. Um, but now, how does this relate to studying, okay, and helping your student understand material and how to make the best use of their time? So let's say that you had a test or a presentation and it was over chapters four, five, and six. According to the primacy recency effect, what chapter are you gonna do weakest on? And that would be the middle chapter, chapter five. So if you know that going in, then you can spend a little bit more time there to make sure that you don't fall into that trap. So part of this is if we recognize in general how our brain works, how our memory works, then we can spend extra time in some of those places to avoid those um, traps. So again, if you had a chapter, a test on chapter or a presentation to do on chapters four, five, and six, probably your weakest area is going to be the middle chapter, chapter five. So you'll want to study that information a little bit more. Also, this relates uh, a lot to something that we call um, distributed studying versus massed practice. All right. So uh, basically, massed practice, you've um, probably, we all know that better as um, cramming. Okay. So when you cram, you study maybe right before a test or you stay up really late right before you have to do a speech or to explain something in a class or 
Um, I think for homeschoolers, sometimes this happens if you have maybe a co-op that meets once a week. Um, like, you know, like the co-op I've been involved with. I cannot tell you how many high school students I've seen come in um, looking pretty rough because they did all of the work for all of their once a week uh, co-op classes the night before. And a lot of them had stayed up most of the night, all right? So, um, so that's something we, we need to kind of try not to get in the habit of. So we cram, we study in one long period of time. So let's say that we study six hours before a test or a class where we wanna participate in discussions, et cetera. So once again, what material are we gonna remember? We're gonna remember that at the beginning, primacy effect, and we're gonna remember that, oops, that at the end, the recency effect. All right, so once again, there's a lot of the material that in the middle that we're gonna be weak on. Now, if instead of cramming for six hours, let's say that uh, a student studies a little bit every day, right? Just like what we tell them all the time. So maybe they study even as little as 20 minutes some days, maybe an hour other days, um, you know, kind of varies but they look at the material every day over you know a four or five day period so we still have the primacy recency effect working against us when we're learning this material so the first time we study we're still going to remember stuff at the beginning and the end better than stuff in the middle and that's going to happen every time okay so we have the primacy and recency effect um, coming into play every time we study but here's the big difference. At the end, look at all this material in the middle that we now know that we probably wouldn't have remembered with the cramming session, okay? We remember that material better because of primacy or recency effect. So if we spread that out and have that happening a little bit every day, we're gonna remember more of the middle material. Okay, the other thing that typically happens in these situations where we split up the studying and the learning is that we actually sleep in between. And sleep is a time when our memories are kind of more set into, uh, into our brain, um, uh, kind of gets more uh, organized in our brain and our long-term memory, et cetera. So we're more likely to remember the material better if we've actually slept on it. So you can see how this is different than somebody who, like I said, maybe they have a co-op or tutorial course. Um, they stay up all the night before getting all their reading done and doing all their homework and preparing for class. Hey they go, Diane, yes. sorry to interrupt you. I think people are only seeing your first slide. Oh, oh dear. Okay. So sorry. Okay. Let me get back here. Sorry about that. Can we see the one that says uh, distributed studying now? I just see you now. Okay, let me go back. All right, I've got the screen share. Okay, now? Distributed studying? Yes. Okay, okay, you're good. All right, let me see if this works. Can you see the chart now with all the colors? Is it moving with me? Yes, ma'am, you're good. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna go back a couple just to kind of, so that make sure that you see this. So this is the chart that has the, um, you know, the response rate for these that we just talked about. Um, the primacy recency with the most people getting the bed and quilt and most people getting the ones there at the end. And then the distributed studying how, um, oops, let me get back to distributed studying, how if we break up the studying, we're getting a whole lot more of the middle material. Okay. Um, all right. Is everybody with me now? We good? 
All right, sorry about that. So, um, so anyway, so by distributing or breaking up your studying, um, you're gonna remember, um, like I said, you're gonna get more of the middle material. Lots of times people actually end up studying less a less number of hours and time than they would if they actually crammed and they end up getting better grades. And so it's kind of a win-win all around. It's like you study less, you make better grades. And also typically the student is less stressed when they do it that way uh, as well. And they're gonna remember the material long-term. And, you know, I think that's the goal of so much of us in homeschooling is like, not just know it, you know, like uh, not just know it now, or like we worry about sometimes, you don't just learn it for the test. You want to learn this information and understand it. So that's another benefit of this. And this is, again, one of those that um, it's so funny to me when I get phone calls or students track me down and they're like, oh, I did that. I, I, I didn't believe you, but I studied some every day instead of just waiting to the night before the test and my grade went way up. Um, and then also, you know, for students who life happens, you know, they meant to cram the night before, but, um, you know, something happened in their family or, or the, and they weren't able to, but they had been studying it along as they went and they were still able to take a test or uh, participate in class with confidence. So, um, you know, I think this is kind of fun for them to, to kind of see how this actually works. All right, so the next area that we see, so we see that after bed and quilt, that, you know, it kind of starts tapering off. Dark is kind of high, but then it starts going down for silence, fatigue, clock, and snoring. I will tell you, sometimes fatigue is a little bit higher if I do this around midterms, because everybody's tired and they remember that word because it's personally meaningful. All right, but we typically are going down until we get to the word night and night shoots up almost uh, every time I do this, um, nearly every student in the class remembers the word night and has that on their list. So the question is why, all right? And y'all know why, I repeated it three times, right? So that's one of the things that again, we tell students over and over again is that you have to kind of keep reviewing stuff. Doing something once isn't enough to really understand it and get it in your brain, um, get it in your memory in a way that you will be able to use it successfully in the future. So um, go over the material more than once. Uh, review material daily, you know, maybe until the test or until you have a class discussion on it or a class pres uh, uh, presentation. And the thing about reviewing material is that reviewing really doesn't have to take that long, all right? I mean, if you heard the material, you basically understood it and you took some notes on it, um, when you go back to review the material, it's, it's not gonna necessarily take that long. Um, so we encourage students um, to take a look at their notes or, or review again their book of what they studied. If it's a math problem, go back and see if they can rework that example again. Um, you know, they don't have to do every problem, but try to do an example uh, to make sure that they still get the information. All right, so the review does not have to take long, but repetition is so important. So what happens when we don't review the material? Basically, you forget it pretty darn quick, all right? So there's some different data out there um, uh, on this topic. Some studies show that we forget up to 85% of what we've heard or learned within 24 hours. All right. So just think about that, mom, you know, um, or dad, when you you're trying to teach your kids something and it's like the next day they totally it's all new to them again. That's what happens. That is that is kind of natural. It happens to us as adults, kind of discouraging when you're a teacher, you know, when you're standing up in front of people and all excited about what you're saying and and uh, realizing that they may forget 85% of it by the next day. But anyway, we call this the Ebenhaus forgetting curve. And um, like I said, there's a couple different versions. Some of the research is a little bit different, but the idea is if you went to class or you had a book or worked with your parent or you read something and you got it 100%, you know, you went slow, you got it. If you don't think about that again, 
for um, uh, another day, you've lost about 50% in this example, all right? And you can see how steeply and quickly this curve um, goes down, you know, how quickly we, all of us as people, forget the information if we don't do something with it. So as a parent, what can we do? Um, first of all, we can build in review. Some curriculum does that for us. Um, sometimes, you know, we need to kind of set that up ourselves so that maybe before we start the next lesson, we review what we did, um, you know, the previous week, kind of quickly make sure that they still have all that information. Um, maybe you discuss it with them. Maybe you do school during the day and then at dinner that evening, you have, you know, you have a discussion about the things that you learned that day. Okay, that's repetition. That is reviewing it. Um, maybe have the student explain um, to you, you know, kind of like, okay, you know, let's pretend you're, you're teaching me this and I have no idea, you know, and then let them explain it to you or teach you the material. So it can be discussion, it can be through teaching, it can be by going back over some examples. But, you know, if you school during the day, you know, sometimes a little review in the evening is a good way to kind of cap off and keep that information in your mind. Having them teach potentially a younger sibling or explain something to a younger sibling is a great way. If you can teach something, you, you really understand it. So, um, so that's another thing that we can have them do. All right. So, uh, and then to avoid that, here's a couple of graphs on uh, just kind of showing how the more we review it, um, the less steep this forgetting curve is. So if we hear something once and we don't do it again, you know, for a week, maybe, you know, we'll lose uh, uh, most of it. We'll probably re uh, remember about 20% after about a week. Um, so that's pretty steep. We lose it pretty quick. But let's say, you know, you're uh, losing that material, you're forgetting it, and then that evening you review it. It doesn't take that long of a review to pop back up to 100% again of that material. And then the curve doesn't dip as steeply. It kind of goes a little bit slower and you review it again and it comes up. And then again, it doesn't, it, you know, it, the, the curve is not as steep. So if you review it three or four times, you're gonna, it's gonna get more solid in your long-term memory. So then let's say that you have, um, you know, maybe the next week you go to your co-op or, or you have a test or, you know, you wanna discuss this material. If you've reviewed it throughout the week, and again, it doesn't have to take that long, um, you're gonna know that material. So before a test or before a class, you're just doing a final review. If you didn't look at the material, you're basically going to have to relearn everything. All right. Um, it may come a little quicker than it did the first time, but you're still going to have to relearn the material. Okay. So um, again, it's important to build in review, build in discussions, um, learn new material, but do a continual review of previous material that you've had um, until it's really, really solid. So, you know, definitely for the first week, you know, you want to try to touch base on it and then maybe touch base on it once a week and, um, and then, you know, kind of spread that time period out longer. Um, but I think when students realize this, and especially when you tell them, you know, you might have to, you know, you might not even have to study or work as long if you use these techniques, sometimes that wins a lot of students over. Um, here's another example of, you know, reviewing the material and how the slope, you know, you can kind of see that it, you don't lose the materials quickly. Um, you can look at how much slower you forget the material after you revisit it a couple of times and um, how much, you know, more you remember than you would have the very first, you know, if you never reviewed the material at all. And so this is a great time saver, you know, as far as, you know, preparing for tests, preparing for discussions, but just for knowing the material, you know, and remembering it. You know, I always say if you're going to spend, you know, um, uh, six hours on something, you know, make it something that, that is useful to you and you can remember and share and use again, okay? 
The other thing that happens with repre repeated review of material is that it actually changes our brain. All right, so when we learn, when we um, engage our memory, our brain actually changes. The, the dendrites are growing spines in our neurons and we're creating pathways in the brain. And um, I always kind of think of this uh, or explain this to students like, um, uh, like if you were in the woods and let's say there's this beautiful view right over, you know, a, a mile that way. And, you know, you try to get there to look at that view. The first time, if you're in the woods and the forest and, and there's no path, it, it's slow going. You know, the, the weeds can tangle, you know, and the, the vines tangle in your feet and, you know, you kind of stumble around. And it's hard to make that. It's not easy. But let's say that you make it from here, mile down to that beautiful view. And then you come back but it was so pretty, you're gonna go there again the next day. And it's still a little, you know, hard and a little slow, but then you go back again and again. And what do you eventually do? You create a path. And when you create that path, it's easy, or so much easier to get from here to that mile down to that beautiful view. Okay, because we have created a path because we've went up and down uh, uh, that place over and over again. So that's kind of the way that review is in our brain. Okay, um, and then even if you don't, like let's say you don't go look at that view for a while, and then you need to start, you want to go back again. It doesn't take as long the second time to create, to get that path nice and easy and quick. Um, so again, reviewing that information, um, and if you can kind of go over for your students why this is so important and why it works the way it, it does, sometimes that can be a real motivator. All right, so the next um, words that kind of pop up here, you can see them, they're kind of that turquoisey green color, is the word toss and the word turn. So um, why are the words toss and turn both a little bit higher? And it is typically because um, we associate those. Usually if you remember one, you remember the other. So if you got toss, you typically got turn. Um, we associate those words. So that's another thing that we can encourage our students to do. And that is to, when they're hearing material, when you're teaching them stuff, to try to make associations and link it to other things. I think this is one of the great things that homeschooling can do. Sometimes in, um, in formal education, it's like we have real discrete categories, like this is your math class, I'm your math teacher. This is your history class, I'm your history teacher. This is your English class. But as homeschoolers, we can treat it more like it is in the real world where they all blend. You know, they're all related in one way or another. So we can encourage students to make associations. Um, to connect what they're learning in one subject with maybe what they're learning in other areas. And again, you know, um, uh, homeschooling gives us a great opportunity to do that. Science, psychology, literature, history, they all overlap. You can find stuff that you're learning in one area that relates. And so the more of those connections, the more that we can get them thinking about those, discussing those, pointing those out, the more they're gonna engage with, remember and understand the material. Um, examples, even asking questions really helps us process the material better. Um, and you know, if they wanna draw it out and actually physically draw lines and, and, and circles and connect that information, um, that's all that's gonna help them remember that information better. Okay, so making those connections. All right, so we've got toss and turn kind of high, yawn was kind of low, and all of a sudden back up high near the top was the word artichoke. So why do we remember the word artichoke? Okay, it's unique, it was distinctive, it stuck out, maybe it was a little funny to some people. Um, so how do we use that? you know, to help our kid remember information that they're learning. First of all, a little silliness um, 
can really help bring delight into the learning and can help students um, uh, remember the information uh, longer. So artichoke, again, it was just kind of funny, it was silly, it didn't make sense, etc. We do this all the time. Uh, we do it with rhymes, you know, when you make a, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, okay? So that's a little rhyme. It's maybe a little, you know, a little trick way to remember it. It's a, maybe something a little silly, and that's going to help us remember that longer. Um, songs. I mean, going way back to the beginning, how did most of us learn our ABCs? A, B, C, D, E. We sang it. I know I'm a bad singer, but um, uh, so you can ignore that. Actually, that was my son's first like sentence to me. I would sing to him every night and he put his little hand on my mouth and said, no, mama, no. <laughs> so it's his first little complete thought. Um, so I know I cannot sing, but, um, but little songs can help us remember the information. Adding some silliness to it, um, mnemonics, little um, word games that we play. Um, so order of operations in math. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, you know. <laughs> so anyway, all of those little songs, mnemonics, rhymes, etc., can help us make the information unique, make it stand out a little bit um, uh, more in the brain and help us remember it. And this doesn't have to be one of those, um, I don't want to call it like, you know, this is the mono, uh, mnemonic for um, how to remember the planets, or this is how we remember that. It can be stuff that you make up and is, and is just silly, you know. Um, I have students who will play uh, like the hokey pokey when they're learning anatomy, like put your... Um, See, and I don't know the bones, so I may be wrong, but like, let's say, put your metacarpals in, take your metacarpals out, you know, and they're doing it physically, it's silly. Lots of times when study groups are using that technique, they end up laughing. Um, and all of that is going to help them remember that material more because it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna have something associated with it and a, uh, an emotion or a giggle or something like that. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think that's when we study late at night, um, which we shouldn't be doing if we're doing the distributed practice, but sometimes, you know, or, or you're with a study group and you've been together a long time, things get really silly. And sometimes it makes no sense to anyone on the outside, but you as a group will chuckle every time you hear, um, you know, a certain science word, because somebody said something, you know, amusing when you guys were talking about that and you remember it. So, um, you know, be creative with that, with your students, um, have a little silliness, help, and that'll help them remember as, as they go through there. Um, other things to kind of, uh, let me kind of stop the share here. All right. Okay. I'm off the PowerPoint now. Is that right? All right. So um, other things, you know, is to encourage your student to pay attention. Um, you know, and again, I know that that's hard and it takes a while for them to take ownership of that. Um, <clears throat> encourage them not to coast. Um, sometimes like we want to count it as school because I sat here, you know, and I opened that page or I had that page open and looked at it for 30 minutes. And that's not really learning the material. Learning the material is engaging with it. Learning the material means that we're not coasting. Um, other uh, suggestions for this is uh, not to study in bed because we associate our bed with sleep and um, Usually we'll be more alert if we're studying someplace else besides like our bed. Um, so, and I always say that even when they go to take tests, if they're going to take the ACT or SAT or something, you know, they're going to be taking the test sitting at a desk. And if they study in a similar position, lots of times that will also uh, help their recall. So important um, to not study in bed. Um, take handwritten notes. Uh, well, again, I think if we, uh, and a lot of research shows that when we start typing notes or taking notes on a laptop, that it turns into just like we're transcribing what is in the book or what somebody is saying, and we're not really processing it. Handwriting notes, um, that's, that's, it's harder. 
and then typing it on the computer. And lots of times we have to process or think about it in order to write it down. And especially if we try to put it in our own words or summarize it. And by doing those things, we're going to remember the information more. I also suggest um, rewriting, you know, your notes afterwards. Some, some people learn that way better than others. So if your student is one of those, maybe have them write it down again, what they were learning, practice it again. Um, and then of course, flashcards are a great way to review. Sometimes just writing your own flashcards is half of it. You know, when you're writing them, you're thinking about it and, and you start learning and remembering the, the material that way as well. So um, that, that's kind of the majority of the things that I wanted to touch base on relative to the psychology of memory. Um, I could talk and talk about this topic. I think it's really fascinating how our brains work. Um, but I think it's important for uh, students, especially as they start getting older, is to not just tell them what to do, but maybe explain to them, you know, why we're making these suggestions or, uh, or why it's a good idea to study this way instead of um, cramming or to do some of their projects a little along the way instead of trying to do it all the night before. Um, so. I think that is all I have. Are there any questions? Let's see. All right. Anybody want to add a question in the chat or have any comments? All right, anybody want to write something in the chat just to make me feel good? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I got some smiles. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I, I think this is a lot more meaningful if we're walking around and writing stuff and doing it all together. But um, hopefully this format, and I so I'm sorry about the slides getting um, uh, kind of not working there for a few minutes. Um, but I think that that it gives you an idea and I'll help you explain that. Uh, let's see. So specific talk for audible learners. Yes, thank you. So for students who learn who are auditory learners, there's um, a few things is probably what they want to do is actually if they've taken notes on something, read their notes out loud. All right, talking through the material. So when I mentioned earlier, like the discussion, the asking questions, those are all important. They may want to, uh, for example, um, read out loud, or um, even if it's just to themselves, that is gonna be important. Sometimes getting books on tape can be important or, or audible books so that they can listen to some of the material. Um, even taping um, uh, or doing, uh, uh, recordings of themselves reading the material and then listen to it again later all of those things lots of times auditory learners also learn particularly well um, when they have study groups and they're with other students because they're going to process that information more if they're talking with other students and they're sharing that information so um so uh faith i hope that kind of gives you some ideas about the auditory learner i think it's like talk you know, and let them move and let them interact with the material. Um, all of those are, are uh, really good ways to engage them. All right. Um, tips for those that have difficulty with online learning. All right. Oh, and actually, yeah, it was Kimberly with the uh, auditory learners and Faith with the online learning. Yeah, online learning is really interesting because I'm not sure. Um, you know, sometimes it's good, but I think kids can really get fatigued with the online learning. So um, I think to break it up as much as possible so they're not just staring at a computer um, uh, for long periods on, uh, you know, on end is one way to do it. To break it up with maybe having them come to you as the parent and have them um, uh, explain it to you 
have them uh, uh, actually maybe listen to it and then write it down and do things outside of being in front of the computer. And sometimes you can actually set um, uh, online learning to read you what they're saying. So it's, uh, so it's something that'll be read to you so the student can move around. And also that's for um, ADD learners is another uh, way. So lots of breaks lots of movement and allow them to do that, to interact with the material in a different way. So maybe instead of just reading about history, they get out a map, maybe they get little toy, toy soldiers and kind of put them in the different places that they were before the battle and, um, and just, you know, make it something that they really can be active in. Uh, other things um, uh, with uh, ADD learners is to, let them move and wiggle, all right? I know for my son, when I would do math flashcards, um, I had a mini trampoline and an exercise ball, which I didn't really use for exercise, <laughs> I should have. But anyway, they were sitting there, so I thought that would burn some calories if I just looked at them. But anyway, so when I would do these flashcards with him, he would, between each flashcard, he would go and jump on the mini trampoline and then roll up onto the exercise ball and then answer the question, uh, give me the math fact and then go back and do it again. So, you know, sometimes that was annoying as a parent, but it really let him move around and uh, he, he seemed to interact and remember the information better. I also gave him more breaks and it would be like, go run around the neighborhood, go ride your bike around the block. Um, for middle schoolers, to how long should they um, uh, spend on a subject to avoid fatigue? Um, sometimes it depends on how difficult the subject is for them. So I think, you know, I would do 30 minutes and then take a 10 minute break or a five minute break and then, you know, see if they could do another 30 minutes on a subject. Um, and again, sometimes it's hard. I know students, for example, who um, if they have a lot of anxiety around a student, or, or I'm sorry, around a subject, like I've seen this with math, sometimes students with a lot of math anxiety, like they can work for 20 minutes and they've just used so much of themselves um, uh, trying to do that, that they're just wore out. And so you kind of have to watch your student because there are a lot of individual differences in that and kind of see how they're going. On the other hand, sometimes, you know, we'll be reading something or uh, students and they're like just enjoying it so much they can't put it down and they don't want to put it down. So um, uh, part of that for the middle schoolers, I think, would be to kind of really watch them and um, kind of see their frustration level and if they start getting antsy. Because very honestly, at a certain point when, and it, that point is different from everybody, but when we start feeling those things, um, you know, you just don't, you don't retain the information as, as uh, long uh, or as well. And, you know, education shouldn't be about checking these boxes for um, time. It should be really how much we processed and learned that information. Um, so, you know, if your kid needs those breaks, um, uh, definitely, you know, be um, kind of watch them, notice their cues, and, you know, when they're ready for that break, let them take a break and do something. Um, uh, physical is really great, you know. Um, uh, something maybe if they're struggling, let them go do something they feel real successful at. So they kind of, you know, uh, feel better, you know, after struggling with something that was very difficult for them. Okay, looks like we've just got a couple minutes left. Any last questions? All right. All right, guys. Well, hey, I had a good time. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed and I hope that this information was useful. Um, so, Y'all have a good day and enjoy uh, the rest of the conference, okay? Bye-bye.